Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. First thing is beautiful fall day. A little chilly. We have up here on the mountain that is Dorset. We had a lot of a lot of frost in the ground. Did everybody else have frost in the ground this morning? Okay. Um, some special prayers. First of all, our thoughts and prayers of, of, of joy and, and thanksgiving are with Colin and Marie Renault, who were united in holy marriage here yesterday afternoon. They're husband and wife now and beginning their life together. And our thoughts and prayers are with them. Also, my Lenny Stocker's mom fell last week. Wednesday, I believe, maybe Thursday morning. And they don't know what the reason was. She was checked out the hospital. They couldn't find anything, but they are suspicious of some cardiovascular things. So she's going to have more testing done. So our thoughts and prayers are with Lenny's mom and the whole family. And also our thoughts and prayers are with the President of the United States and his family um, going through the coronavirus. And, and hopefully, prayerfully, he will be better And all those that apparently have it now that were around him. Um, and we also say a prayer for those people who wish him dead. It, it just saddened me that, that, that some very prominent people, you know, this dumb Twitter stuff. I don't know you guys said this. Should we want to do away with Twitter? I mean, I just, should we just want to do away with Twitter? The people that are coming out and, and hope, praying for the coronavirus and praying that the president dies, and, you know, that, we pray for them too because their hearts are in a bad place. So lots of prayers are needed this morning, as always. We take all our prayers to our, our Lord, knowing he hears and answers them according to his good and gracious will. And we begin this morning by singing our opening hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now, hymn 902. <laughs> God, merciful Father, I am a poor, miserable sinner. Confess my sins unto you. 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 Confess my sins unto you
confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Dear friends, upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now continue with our intro for this morning which is found in your service bulletin insert. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever.
reading from the Lutheran Confessions for this morning comes from Article 6 of the Unaltered Augsburg Confession regarding new obedience. Our churches teach that this faith is bound to bring forth good fruit. It is necessary to do good works commanded by God because of God's will. We should not rely on those works to merit justification before God. The forgiveness of sins and justification is received through faith. The voice of Christ testifies, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants who have only done what was our duty. The fathers teach the same thing. St. Ambrose says, it is ordered, it is ordained of God that he who believes in Christ is saved, freely receiving forgiveness of sins without works through faith alone. A reading from our Lutheran Confessions. And now our readings from God's holy, inspired, and inherent word. Our Old Testament reading for this morning from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choice wines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed. And briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant offering. And he looked for justice, but behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yet no abuse 
Enriched by knowing the scandal of the cross. Our epistle for this morning is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his suffering, becoming like him in death, in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. around it, and dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season of for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they, had, they held him to be a prophet. This is the Gospel of our Lord. confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last day. Please be seated. We now sing our sermon hymn, hymn 941. We praise you and acknowledge you, O God.
And I want to read a good portion of that again for you. Here another parable. There was a householder who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, and dug a wine press in it and built a tower, and let it out to tents, and went into another country. When the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get the fruit. And his tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to, the ten to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The very stone which the, the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruits. <coughs> Have you ever known somebody so foolish? Have you ever known somebody as foolish as the tenants in this parable? Just think about it. Just think about their behavior. The owner of the land sets up a vineyard, does all this work, builds walls around it, makes it produce and be fruitful and put plants of vineyard and brings water into it and all this. And then the owner, the one whom it belongs to, goes out and he brings people in to make them a part of his vineyard and tells them to work and that he will come to gather the fruits when the fruits are ready. Seems like a pretty standard contract operation, right? Okay? You own something, you hire people, you set the rules, and the people follow the rules and respect you as the, the owner, the one that gave them the opportunity, or they get thrown out, right? Well, think of what the parable tells us. The people who should have understood these very clear rules, when the owner of the vineyard sent his servants to gather the fruit, the wine, the grapes of the vineyard, the tenants, instead of doing what they were obligated to do, or respecting his laws, respecting his rules, respecting the owner of the vineyard, they mistreated the tenants. In fact, mistreated them terribly. Beat one, killed another, and then stoned a third. And stoning could often result in death anyway. So this was a terrible thing. Have you ever seen anyone so foolish? Well, then the owner of the vineyard sent more tenants, thinking, surely, surely my tenant, or my, sent more servants, surely my tenants can't be this foolish. And, and this disrespectful and this, this bad in failing to recognize that I'm the owner and that, that I've given them all they have. So he sent more tenants into the vineyard. Or more, or more servants, excuse me, to the tenants. And they did the same thing. They did the same thing to those servants that they did to the first. Well, then the owner says, you know what? I'm going to send my son. Certainly, certainly they will respect my son. And they will treat my son with respect. And they will give him the fruits. They will show him that they understand the obligations. And they respect me as the owner. And they understand the rules and the, and the requirements for living in the vineyard. What did they do? They killed the son. Have you ever known anyone so foolish? Isn't it crazy? 
I was listening to a podcast the other day about this particular text and something I didn't know, put it in context for the people that lived in that time, possession was really nine-tenths of the law in those days. If you, if you had possession of it, you really had it. So that adds a little bit of understanding to how foolish and why these tenants would have been so foolish. In their mind, they thought if they could get rid of the servants of the owner and get rid of the son who was the heir to the property, then they could have the property, the vineyard, and all its fruits all for themselves. That adds a little context into what they might have been thinking, but still, have you ever known anybody so foolish to do this? But Jesus asks the question after he tells the parable. And he says to the people listening, what do you think the owner, the householder, should do to those tenants that didn't respect the owner and didn't respect his rules and his law and didn't respect his son? What do you think he should do to them? And the people listening, interestingly enough, those listening said, oh, he should take them and kill those miserable wretches and throw them out of there. Right? But we're told after the parable, the Pharisees were listening. The Pharisees were listening and they got wind. We think he might be talking about us. Oh, no. Have you ever known anybody so foolish? Well, we know what this parable means, right? This is a parable that's not all that hard to figure out. God is the owner of the vineyard. The owner of everything, right? He's the one that created the vineyard, made it beautiful, made it productive, made it grow things, was, made it a wonderful home for those living in it to live in. And we know that the servants were the prophets, were the people God sent to speak His Word to His people, to see about the fruits that should have been being produced in the vineyard. And we know that the tenants, the ones who were supposed to be working the vineyard, were God's people, who by His grace were given the vineyard to live in and to produce fruit in and to live and, and, and make their families and, and have a wonderful life in. Right? Now this is interesting, because when you think about this parable, you think about the vineyard analogy, it sort of makes you think of the Old Testament reading for this morning, doesn't it? All the way back in Isaiah, chapter 5, right? Was it 5? Right? He calls, God calls Israel, his people, his vineyard. But he says that the vineyard he planted to produce wonderful, beautiful, delicious grapes produced wild grapes. Instead of producing wonderful big grapes for harvest and wine and everything, the vineyard produced wild grapes tiny little grapes that were sour and good for nothing. And think about the history of Israel when they would have heard Isaiah 5 and then when they would have heard the parable the Lord told about the vineyard and the tenants. God had delivered, He had taken His people who had nothing, who were slaves in a foreign land, and he had brought them out of slavery and he had given them the wonderful vineyard that is the promised land, right? A land flowing with milk and honey. He had gave that to them and he had set boundaries around them. He had protected them and he had told them the rules for living in the vineyard. But the people continually rejected the rules. And we see that throughout all of the Old Testament. They continually rebelled against the owner, against the Lord and His rules for living in His vineyard. They beat the prophets. They killed the prophets 
They stoned the prophets that God continually sent to them over and over and over again to remind them of His love and His rules and His guidance for them. How they should live. The timing of this is interesting, isn't it? The timing of the parable that Jesus tells. If you look at the context of the passage, which is always important, Jesus told this series of parables after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So the Pharisees weren't all that far off when they said, I wonder if he's talking about us. Because in four days, four days after Jesus told this parable about the wicked tenants in the vineyard rejecting the servants of the Lord, the prophets, the Lord would send His Son. The owner of the vineyard would send His very Son just as Jesus told and prophesied in the parable, the owner would send His Son. And what would those Pharisees and religious leaders do? They would say, this is the heir. This is the heir. Let's kill him and let's take the inheritance for ourselves. Because possession is nine-tenths of the law. We've killed the servants every time the prophets came and told them, repent, stop doing what you're doing. You know what the Lord says about His law and living in the vineyard in His promised land. Every time they kill them and stoned them and mocked them and throw them out, throw them outside the vineyard. And now they will do the same thing with the son. And on Good Friday, those same Pharisees who they sort of knew, they had the son arrested, and on Friday, they had the son killed. It's amazing the context of what Jesus is talking about. And those silly Pharisees, those silly religious leaders, those silly, silly ones that were living in the tenants or in the vineyard and thinking they were running the vineyard instead of listening to the owner of the vineyard. <coughs> They actually thought they were doing the right thing. And they thought that the Lord would bless them for killing His Son. Have you ever known anyone so foolish? But that's not the end. The Lord ends with the wonderful Gospel when He says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone Therefore, God has done this and He will take what was given to you, those wicked tenants, and He will give it to others who will produce fruit. So hopefully by now, as we talk about this parable, I hope you're starting to think about the relevance of this parable in your life. Have you ever known anyone so foolish? Now think about, who did God give the vineyard to? Who did the Son take the vineyard, the promised land, the kingdom, and give it to? Us. All those who were outside of it, who the tenants at the time thought could never amount to anything, because they weren't God's special people. He gave it to the Gentiles. He brought the Gentiles in. And He did this by bringing them in by baptism. By building a wall around them. By putting them in this promised land where He feeds them with His grace and mercy. With the grapes, the wine that come His very body and blood. His Word that sustains them and forever lifts them up and reminds them of His love. Dear friends, we have now been brought into the vineyard. We're the ones living in the vineyard. By God's grace, we're the tenants of the vineyard now. But oh, the relevance of the parable. Have you ever known anyone as foolish as those tenants? They rejected the laws of the Lord, the laws of the owner of the vineyard. And they rejected His Son and they lost the vineyard. Putting in modern terms for us, 21st century confessional Lutherans, 
They rejected the law and the gospel. They rejected the law and the gospel and they lost the vineyard. They lost their ability to live in the vineyard and to receive everything that the owner of the vineyard gave them out of his grace and love and mercy. So where this parable becomes relevant for us today, we want to beware of ever becoming such foolish people. I want to realize that those silly, foolish people that say, I'm a New Testament Christian, I pay no attention to the Old Testament, they're in great danger. Because the tenants in the Old Testament, they were saved by the same thing that those of us, the tenants in New Testament times, are saved by. Faith in the coming of the Messiah. The people in Isaiah's day were saved by the coming of Jesus and believing in the coming of Jesus. The coming of the Son who would die on the cross for their sins. Just like those of us, you and me, who by God's grace are tenants in His vineyard now, we're saved by the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. But back to the question, have you ever known anyone so foolish? How would anyone ever reject the law and the gospel? How could they ever reject the, the law of the owner of the tenant and reject his son? Well, sadly, it happens all the time in our world today where people, they reject the law of the Lord by holding on to sin. By holding on to sin and failing to repent of that sin. It's just that little sin in my life. It's just that little sin that I, that I sort of like, I struggle with, but I sort of like it. And it's that little bit of addiction in my life, that little problem, but nobody really knows about it. Nobody understands it. It could be gossip. It could be lust. It could be addiction. It could be hatred that we turn into justification for our feelings. So many of these things, so many of these things that we figure... I, I'm a good Christian. I can be a good Christian too. I, I, I just... I can't stop feeling the way I do about that person. I just can't. Because they're a bad person. And the Lord knows what they did to me. They're, they're deserving of my feelings towards them. But otherwise, I'm a good Christian. I go to church. I go to church and I pay my taxes and I'm a good citizen. And I care about people generally except that that person that just did that wrong to me, I can't get over that, but no way, I'm, they were wrong and the Lord knows they were wrong. Or the man who looks at pornography secretly, good man, he, he's a good man, he, but the relationship in his marriage is not what it used to be, and he struggles with those feelings, and he does it privately, he does it privately, and he doesn't think anybody has to know, and he's a good person otherwise. He's a good person. He goes to church. He pays his taxes. He's a good neighbor. Good citizen. Good Christian. Except for that one little thing. But that's just a little thing. Now, we could talk about this for 20 minutes and my sermon would get way, way, way too long, right? That's what happens. Have you ever known anybody so foolish? And it's not just individuals. Churches can do this too by starting to downplay the law of Christ. And it might look something like this. It might look like, you know, we need to stop preaching the law because the law makes people feel bad. And if you look out at our pews, our pews aren't so full anymore. And the checkbook's getting a little tighter in church and we need people in church. And we want to reach out to people with the gospel so... We just don't talk about the law anymore because the law might hurt people's feelings and might keep people from coming and being a part of our church. And we can't afford that. And we don't want that. We want them to be a part of our church. So we can't say things and talk about things that might sound like law or accuse them of sin. Or then there's churches that they say they're Christian, 
they have Christian on the outside, outside their, their church, but when it comes to acknowledging and professing before man that Jesus is the only way, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him, they start to downplay that because that doesn't sound open and loving and diverse and tolerant and all those things that the world's telling us we have to be. Have you ever known anyone so foolish? Well, consider this parable, dear friends, and remember, the owner of the vineyard loves you. The owner of the vineyard brought you into his vineyard out of love and grace and mercy because you mean more to him than everything. The owner of the vineyard has laws. The owner of the vineyard has gospel. Repent. If you've ever known anyone so foolish, if that foolishness ever comes close to home, repent. Believe in Jesus Christ. Trust the owner of the vineyard, his law and his gospel, and rejoice, rejoice that you are forgiven and kept in his vineyard for all eternity because he loves you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.
thwart the actions of terrorists and those who would oppress with power and fear. Bless Donald, our president, and all he's going through right now and his family, our governor, and all who pass and force, make and judge our laws. Spare us from disease and fear, deliver the poor from want, and help us to provide jobs and worthy employment for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, guide, guide husbands and wives to love and forgive each other and strengthen them in their life together. Bless the homes in which your people dwell. Help parents to be faithful examples for their children and give room in their hearts and homes so that orphans may know the joy of a place and a home to call their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, deliver the sick from their illnesses Give relief to the suffering, help to the troubled, to know the peace of mind, to know peace of mind, and be with the grieving and those in their final days. Guide all health care professionals and serve them in their need, and give patience to those who must bear with their infirmities, disabilities, and infertility. Hear us especially as we pray for those we mentioned at the beginning of service this morning, and those we now name before you, Lord, in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Holy God, give us a willing spirit that we may serve you with all that we have and all that we are. Help us to be faithful and fruitful in the godly use of resources and gifts that we may use them in accord with your will and for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, keep us from resentful hearts that would begrudge your mercy or live selfishly for ourselves and teach us to live for you. The life that you have given us, treasuring in our hearts all that is good and wise and seeking after those things. Lord, in your mercy, Hear us, O Lord, and give answer to the prayers of your people. Pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom with the Father and the Spirit, you are one God and one Lord, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who Lord, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn, Lord Dismiss Us With Your Blessing, hymn 924.
Just a few announcements before we go and enjoy a beautiful fall day. Um, we're going to continue our Bible study in the overflow this morning on the This is the Life series. And this morning, you'll see a wonderful episode of This is the Life that, for those of you who are sci-fi fans like me, Star Trek geeks like me, a very, very significant actor in our history and our past is in that show. And he will live long and prosper if that gives you him. Okay? So come and join us for that Bible study and we'll go through the really good episodes and we talk about our faith life after that episode. So um, we're going to start a new book on Thursday. We finished up Dreams and Visions, a wonderful book about how the Lord is working in the Muslim world. Now we're starting a new book. It's more of a novel. It really is just sort of a novel. It's called Ashes in the Snow. It's an award-winning novel, and you can see a little summary of that book in your insert this morning. We'd love to have you. And the group has thought about the idea, when we get to the, close to the end of this book, we're going to ask the congregation for suggestions, possible books we could read next, because we want more of you to come and be a part of our book reading group. So be thinking about a book that would be appropriate for a book reading group in the future, and we're going to ask your opinion. Okay? Um, Men's Club meets this Friday. LWML meets this Wednesday. Watch for the Holy Communion schedule at the end of the month. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is now instead of Tuesday through Friday, and only 10 o'clock and 6 o'clock because nobody's really signing up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I guess that's all I have. Anybody? Rick. Oh, the potatoes. Thank you. Daisel and Renee picked up, went out and picked up a bunch of potatoes, and they're sitting in a sack out here, and they want the congregation to enjoy them. So as you're leaving and you want some potatoes, feel free to grab some potatoes. Okay? And, and say a prayer of Thanksgiving to Daisel and Renee. Book of Concord, the kids are having, the, having their, their studies, so remember to bring your Book of Concord. Okay? Anything else? Well, have a wonderful day, guys. God bless. Stay safe. And bask in the grace of our Lord. God bless.